Welcome to Gold Derby. I'm senior editor Denton Davidson here with Michael Gorzian, the writer, director, and star of Americazzi, Armenia's entry for Best International Feature at the 96th Academy Awards. Michael, what does it feel like to hear that? What, what, what was it like to be selected for Armenia's representation at this year's Oscars? Uh, well, um, I was very excited. Um, you know, I, I think going into making the film, I always had in my head that like it would be great to get to represent the country um and help it have more of a voice in terms of world cinema i think uh not a, not a lot of films have been made in armenia um partially because it's a you know post soviet country and when the soviet union collapsed a lot of the infrastructure for film sort of fell away um so that it was kind of one of our goals with the film to help showcase what's possible in armenia so I'm I'm very excited about it. And it was not only selected by Armenia, but it's been shortlisted now by the Academy. So it's just one of 15 films that could potentially be nominated out of so many. So it's it's really a great accomplishment. Um, I mentioned that you're not only the star, you're the writer and director. So talk to me about this story and the inspiration to write a film about a man named Charlie, this Armenian American who goes back to Armenia during Soviet control following World War II. Um, well, there was, a, uh, there were a few different things that motivated me for, for this script. Um, I started writing it in 2018, um, when the country was in the midst of a, a revolution, well, a velvet revolution, um, where it was shifting kind of from being run more by post-Soviet, uh, uh, sort of the, the government was very, uh, part of the Soviet Union and moving more Western, I guess. Um, and in watching that, I saw a lot of Armenians from the diaspora moving back to Armenia, starting businesses. Uh, there was an energy and an excitement in the country, uh, which in watching that, I started to learn about uh, repatriation and the history of uh, with Armenia over the past hundred years, all these different waves of Armenians had, that have been moving back to the country or trying to move back to the country. And this period, right after World War II, uh, Stalin had reached out to Armenians in uh, the diaspora and invited them to, to move back and, and help rebuild the country. And uh, learning about that, I was blown away. I was surprised that I had never, I didn't know much about it before, but uh, about over 100,000 uh, Armenians went, about 300 from America. And, uh, you know, it was a disaster. <laughs> uh, oh. What was promised, uh, Stalin promised, uh, none of what was promised was there. And so it was a very tough situation. And uh, in learning about it, I decided to write sort of a comedy. <laughs> Not really a comedy, but... Uh, I took, Armenians have been through so much, you know, with the genocide and, and so many, so many difficult times, but uh, we've always survived. And that idea of um, despite what's going on, finding a way to continue on and thrive and keep your smile, that was sort of the, the theme or inspiration for the story. There these are devastating circumstances that Charlie finds himself in, but he is a relatively upbeat guy and has a sense of humor. There's almost like a, like a childlike innocence about him in some ways. Like he just feels um, like ever the optimist. What was it that you wanted to instill in Charlie? That, that like, what did you want this character to bring out in people? Well, um, <clears throat> I mean, there's a couple layers to it. One is, you know, there was an American idealism at the time or an energy in that in the uh, late 40s, 50s, the I can do it sort of mentality. Um, so there was a bit of that. But more than that, I think. Um, so the, the film itself, I mean, it's I wouldn't call it historic fiction. It's more of a fable. Um, and as a fable, uh, this main character isn't necessarily meant to be it's uh there's a concept called the holy fool in 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 dramaturgy 
And Charlie is a bit of that. It's kind of like, uh, if you remember the film Being There uh, with uh, Peter Sellers, uh, it's a similar sort of, you need a clown, uh, someone who is not really part of the world that he's in to kind of be able to reflect and show what's going on. And so Charlie as a character being this optimist and and despite everything that's going on and how terrible it is, always just trying to find what's trying to find a way to make it okay. Um, it's a way of sort of reflecting and showing the circumstances, I guess. So that was kind of why the, the, that approach. And Charlie's imprisoned for years, but he finds entertainment and fascination and um, maybe even just maintains a sanity by watching this couple through his window in an apartment. Um, and it's fascinating to see him sort of come up with like what they're saying. And, and he's sort of, this is like TV for him. But yeah. what I also found fascinating is that he kind of finds this love for art um, in, in this moment. What was it about art at the time that was so dangerous for people? And, and why did you want to um, hone in on that on, on artists during that era? Mm. Well, um, some of that is actually based on, a, a lot of the film was inspired by, I did a lot of, interviewed a lot of uh, repatriates and, and descendants of repatriates and collected a lot of stories of what people went through. And one of them actually, uh, our producer, Patrick Malkassian, his, uh, his father and his grandfather-in-law was a repatriate who was arrested for painting pictures of churches and was sent to Siberia for it. And so that story sort of inspired me, the idea that like, and, you know, in the film, uh, there's a character who, who, who is that the Charlie is watching this guy who's, who's an artist who similar was, uh, censured for, for painting pictures of churches. Um, I think, it's part of the idea of as much as you want to repress people or, you know, the film is a little bit about Charlie goes there hunt, searching for his identity, searching for his Armenian culture and ends up with just the Soviet system where Armenia has been sort of cut down to you're not Armenian, you're, you're a Soviet citizen. But in this apartment that he's watching, he's seeing all of the sort of behind curtains, seeing the culture he's been searching for. And to me, I think the act of creating and being creative, you can't stop it. It's like a, you know, I, the image I've always had in my head is like when you see in the, uh, like on a road concrete and you see a flower blooming uh, through the concrete. It's like, you can't keep creativity down. You can't, squish it and so it just went hand in hand the idea that um that art the need to create and the you can't you know put put a guy in a prison in a cell lock him up but still he's going to find a way to 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 create so what was it like for you as an american an armenian american to be back in armenia and you know, be fully immersed in this culture that your ancestors come from? And, you know, how long were you there? And what was the process like? Well, we shot in uh, March of 2020 is when we started. So if you remember, <laughs> that's right when the pandemic started. Rough timing. Yeah. 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 We were about 10 days in when we had to lock down. Uh, I ended up being stuck in Armenia for I think uh, seven, seven months or so. Um, we went, you know, there were periods where I was locked in an apartment in, in, uh, you know, quarantine for months at a time. Uh, so it was a very difficult, but a, a lot of those difficulties sort of played into the, what the film is. Um, you know, I playing the role of Charlie spent like many people months locked up, staring out my window wishing I could go outside and then you know that played into what we shot um so it was you know doing a doing a film that's in three different languages in a foreign country is tough enough but then throw up 
world pandemic on top of it. It was yeah. uh, it was pretty wild. But like the theme of the film, we did our best to take, you know, every obstacle that came our way and just tried to find the opportunity in it. And I would say, even though it was more difficult, uh, things like that, it made it a better, ultimately made it a better film. Um, and I, I read somewhere that I, I believe that it was almost 90% of, you know, the cast and the crew were Armenian. And oh, yes. so what was it like to, what is the film industry like there? What was it like to cast the film and, and find the crew that you needed to, to put this film together? Um, well, yeah, a uh, handful of people from the diaspora, or Armenians from the diaspora, and then a few non-Armenians that came over. But yeah, 90% of the film was casting crew were based in Armenia. Um, I went there a year before and did some scouting and uh, some sort of general casting to start. Uh, but I mean, there's so many talented people there. Uh, I mean, there were actors that I wish I could have cast. I, I would have added more roles if I could have. Um, it like th there is really not much of a infrastructure uh, or it's building right now. Uh, but once pre-soviet when the when when armenia was part of the soviet union films were made there like there was a sound studio that we shot in but it hadn't been used for decades and like had you know the roof was leaking uh, we had to fix the roof we had, you know things like that so it's rough but part of that roughness um for me is what made it exciting and interesting i mean they're unlike the u.s there's you know I'll tell you, I'll tell you a fun little story. There's a scene in it where um, the guy in the apartment is putting things in the window for Charlie to, to draw like uh, art, uh, insta you know, still lifes for him to draw. And on a whim, we were shooting that. And I thought, wouldn't it be funny if the guy uh, just brought in a live goat and had it on the table for him to draw. And, you know, 10 minutes later, one of the ADs brings a goat in. And it's like in the U.S., you could never do that. The U.S., there would have to be a goat wrangler. There would be a goat teacher. There would be, you know, you'd have all this stuff that you'd have to do there. So because of that, there's still a bit of freedom, um, I think, which I enjoyed quite a lot. Um, so, yeah. The, another thing that I loved was just the production production design, particularly, well, I love the apartment across the street and just the, like, just the visual that it gave the audience. But... Also, his cell, there's a scene that isn't really, you know, giving anything away in the plot. But there's that scene where he we see him quickly rearrange everything. He puts his bed up, looks up in the ceiling that has the clothesline. But it, it moves almost like a musical in some ways. That's what it reminded me of when I was watching it. Mm -hmm. um, talk about that and, and the production design and, and, and kind of what inspired that scene, because that was just one of my favorite scenes that made me smile. Um, well, I mean, I've always been a Buster Keaton fan for one. Okay. Uh, and I love physical, I, I love, um, not so much comedy, but the dance of it. Uh, like you said, uh, the choreography of, of beautiful, um, using like, there's so many, so many things you can do with film that, uh, and that to me, that's one of them is, is the mise-en-scene with, instead of using shots to really design things within the frame. Um, and so, I mean, like I said, we had, because of the pandemic, we had a lot more time uh, than we, we had originally uh, allotted for. So like with the cell, I think we were in lockdown probably two months before we were allowed to shoot any of the cell scenes. So our production team would sneak up to the soundstage at night and like work on it at night just to because they wanted to like do something so uh yeah i mean it was a little bit of it was uh being able to play almost like theater um play around a bit um but i would say i mean inspiration wise you know i've always loved uh like i said buster keaton or uh films like that that 
you know, you. Well, they call him, they call him Charlie Chaplin. I mean, they, they kind yeah, of, yeah. they kind of and, mock and, him a little bit. And I'm curious because you played Charlie Chaplin Jr. In, yeah. in a film with Robert Downey Jr. back in 1992. So was that an homage or, or just a coincidence? It was a total coincidence. Uh, <laughs> okay. I don't even think it was really in the script uh, or maybe it was, it, I, it came out of, yeah. I, I mean, uh, some of the actors were nicknamed, were, would call me Charlie, Char like it was kind of a, a nickname that stuck. So uh, it, it works. And you dedicate the film to your grandfather. Why was that important to you? Well, one, my grandfather was a, genocide survivor and you know i think the the boy in the box at the beginning is kind of a version of him mm. uh but more importantly from what i remember of him um you know despite the things he went through um uh, he was he wouldn't ever talk about i never heard him talk about what he had gone through but at least to me he was very um he was kind and nice and and happy and encouraged me to be uh happy and smile and for someone who went through what he had gone through to have that demeanor um to me i think the essence of charlie is sort of an homage to my grandfather and before i let you go i want to take you back um I want to go through some awards history with you because uh, when you were about 23, you became the second youngest ever winner of Best Supporting Actor in a TV Miniseries or Movie Emmy um, for David's Mother. And you were like 23 up against Alan Alda, Matthew Broderick, Richard Gere, and Ian McKellen. So what was that kid thinking going into the Emmys? What do you remember about that experience and then and then winning? What was What was that like for you? Well, um, I felt like definitely the, uh, what am I doing here? Um, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, with all these, I think a lot of people thought that as well, which may be why I won. Uh, they were like, wait a minute, who's that guy? <laughs> <laughs> um, and maybe, I don't know, maybe ho hopefully if we get nominated, maybe Armenia will be the same thing. We'll be like wait a minute okay yeah france england of course armenia what are they doing here um so yeah we were i was a bit of the dark horse then and and hopefully armenia will be the dark horse this year i love that and and what do you hope people get out of this film and in terms of their thoughts on armenia you said it's not a historical film but it is i mean it does give you a sense um, and there there are historical pieces that I certainly didn't know. I'm, you know, we're not taught a lot of Armenian history in America. So I certainly learned a lot, even though it's not a historical piece. What would you like people to take away from the film? I would say, I mean, there's all the, there's, there's a lot of culture, Armenian culture that is packed into the apartment that Charlie is watching. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea of using voyeurism as a, a vehicle to share. Um, I wanted the audience to be like Charlie and, and instead of shoving it in your face, but uh, it's more of you're like this guy peeking in a window, getting a glimpse of what Armenian culture is. So there's that aspect. But then I would say probably more important is um, Armenians have a lot, I would say to learn from the rest of the world as a, as a, um, uh, you know, as a country and, uh, but in, if there is something that Armenia has to share with, with everyone else, it's, we've survived, we've been through, you know, the culture is very old and it's a culture that that's important to the whole world. It's not just for Armenians, like what, th there's such depth in Armenian culture and so much there. And we've been through one thing after another i mean I, it's being armenian is a little bit like rooting for a team that's always losing sometimes it feels like that sometimes like we're always just like oh this has happened now and this has happened despite it all we're still here we've survived and we're still enjoying life and smiling and i would say that is what i would would want more than anything that people take away from the film is 
I mean, the world's crazy now and there's all sorts of things to go, oh God, things are terrible. It's falling apart. But, you know, you still have to smile and enjoy life. And and I think that's the more important part of the film. Yeah. Well, it certainly made me feel that way and it's beautifully done. So congratulations. Best of luck to you at the Oscars and thanks for chatting with Gold Derby today. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. 